Good morning again. Uh, welcome again. Today is August 30th. Again, this is uh, Physical Science uh, 110. And uh, today is week three, actually. And we have quite a few things. One of them, or at least two of them, one of the announcements I sent earlier in the day, and at least I know some of you have received it, so if you didn't uh, check your email, please do so, is about the meeting this coming uh, Wednesday at 1 p.m. You're invited to it, everybody is. I know it's called the STEM Club, but actually you might as well enjoy yourself if you participate in it. So it's something that might interest you and it does actually interest me and I'm going to be involved with the club. I'm not going to be the mentor for the club or the coordinator yet, but I want to be involved as much as possible and hopefully to see what people are doing in here and uh, how am I going to benefit from it and help in it as much as I can. So this is one thing that is planned this uh, Wednesday. And uh, there was an event that I mentioned in the past that was supposed to be happening uh, by NASA and by the end of October. Now it has been postponed and that is the launch of the James Webb uh, uh, telescope, which is a big deal. As a matter of fact, uh, what is it? Not this Thursday, but the Thursday of the 19th. Myself and some students from another college where I was actually involved with some other activities, we had a chance to go and actually see the actual James Webb uh, telescope just before being shipped to, uh, to, uh, to uh, what is it, French Guiana. That's what it's going to be launched from. And from there, it's going to go into space about a month later. Initially, the plan was October 31st. Now it has been delayed. And uh, it's actually sitting in here. It was at least when we went there, it was sitting in Long Beach in uh, the LA area. So uh, we have had a chance to see that. So these are some of the things that uh, is, uh, is, is nice to be involved with. And I'm hoping that you guys will join us on uh, Wednesday. And uh, you might enjoy it and hopefully get something out of it and uh, do stuff, okay? That's one thing. The other thing also, which is important, and I did not send a message yet, but I will, is about next week. Monday, September 6th is actually a holiday. So we cannot do our live session on Monday because it's an off day. But because what is coming is of extreme importance, namely that we have our exam one, which is coming in toward the end of the week, next week or early the week after, uh, we really have to have a live session. So uh, I'm going to move the live session to Wednesday. Not this Wednesday. The Wednesday here will be available also if you guys want to meet, but we definitely have to also do the, uh, the STEM club after that. But actually the Wednesday, September 7th. So our, no, September 8th, would that be? September 8th. September 7th is a Tuesday. So instead of doing September 6th live session where we're supposed to be meeting, but because it's a holiday, we cannot do that day. And because it's important that we discuss what we have covered and to prepare for the exam, I think we're going to have a live session on the, on the, uh, on the 8th. I strongly urge you to attend it live. You might have a question that we cannot cover if you're not there. So if you are attending the live session and you ask a question, that's, that's actually very helpful and useful. In either case, it's going to be recorded and posted on Canvas. And there will be also an assignment based on that, on that attendance. So you are still required to watch it later on recorded if you cannot make, make the live session. So this is basically important stuff that is related to uh, what is coming. And I hope that you guys will uh, will participate and engage and do all of the things that you're supposed to be doing. Sounds good? Yes. Okay, very good, thank you. So it seems like somebody's celebrating a birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Let's me jump into what we have this week so that we are on the same page and we see what kind of uh, assignments we have. So I have your class in here and I have it, I'm looking at it as a student. So let me jump into it to see what we have this week. 
So again, the previous week review, which was a big week, by the way, and it's a big deal, okay? It has to do with the three laws of Newton. You are supposed to have an understanding of that. And it's really amazing stuff that uh, the, the discussion that comes from it. So I really want you guys to uh, make sure you have that appreciation of these three laws, only these three laws, okay? No more, okay? You don't need four laws. You cannot survive with two. So basically exactly three and they have to be in this order, okay? So that was from the previous week. Uh, the terminology also and the words is in summary in here. So these are the key concepts. Can we turn off the microphone? Sometimes it's okay, I did. Okay, so let me go back. So again, is everybody looking at the screen I'm sharing in here with you guys? Yes, sir. Yes. Very good. So these are some of the key concepts which bring me to the first item of the discussion today. Okay. And I'm going to type it for you guys since you're live in here, so you get a benefit from it typed. But please put in your own words because you're supposed to understand. And it's simple enough that you can, you can decipher it. Okay. It is not this terminology that is you're going to be tested on. It is not the PowerPoint I post. It is not even the summary I do. It is the summary basically I report to you guys. Or when we come live in here in discussion, we even do some problems and discuss them. That is not important and how we're going to be tested. It is gonna be based on your reading the chapter and understanding it. Because in my doing so, coming up with a summary, I'm giving you my version of it, number one. What I think is important, okay, number one. Number two also, the PowerPoint also deals with the same thing. These pages that you see in here, the previous week notes, is really some sort of a summary. Do not rely on this and making them into like, this is basically what I need to know from this class. These are just like points in there, pointers, that's all. The key thing in here is reading the entire chapter, all of the sections in it, and understanding them. If you don't understand something or something is not, does not make sense to you, reach out. Hopefully you're working in teams, try to decipher it together. If not, reach out, ask me, okay? That is really how you're going to be tested. So that is really the point in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want you guys to remember. So reading understanding you read is what you will be tested on not or oh, that's it that's good enough basically do not rely on these pages by themselves and say, oh, point one, two, three, four. And I'm gonna share the screen again so that we see what I'm talking about. Okay, last week, uh, the forces act in pairs and it's not even in an order, it's an alphabetical order. It's not in a conceptual order, okay? Forces act in pair. This is due to the third law of Newton that basically the action and reaction, the forces pair. The free fall is when an object falls with the acceleration of the ground of the earth, okay? Uh, interaction is uh, so, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the interaction or the forces between objects when they do interact. Newton's first law of motion, here it's stated. You can put it in your own words if you like. An object is under no net forces. It's going to remain at rest if it was at rest or continue moving with the same speed in the same direction if it was moving, a mouthful. The second law of, uh, of Newton, which is in here, and that tells you that basically if an object is under net forces, in this case, it's going to accelerate. And the acceleration is algebraically equal to the sum of the net forces, basically, the algebraic sum of the forces, some of them positive, some of them negative. So at the end of the day, it's going to be a net difference between them. And 
and uh, inversely proportional to the mass and the inertia. The more mass you have, the less acceleration you have. So this is the second law of Newton. The third law, whenever two objects interact, they do so in such a way if one exerts a force on the other, the other exerts a force that is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Those are the three laws. That's all you need to understand everything. Terminal speed, when an object is in free fall because of the force of drag, and the force of a drag is proportional to the velocity, the object starts to gain more and more velocity. In doing so, the drag increases more and more. At some point, the drag will, cancels the, uh, will cancel the, uh, the, uh, the weight. And in this case, the acceleration becomes zero. So whatever the velocity that the object had immediately before these two forces cancel out is the terminal velocity. That's why we use parachutes, by the way. We use parachutes to increase the drag force. And the drag force is proportional to the cross section, to the area. So the bigger the area, the bigger the drag is. In addition to uh, the conditions in the atmosphere, namely the density of the atmosphere, the thicker the atmosphere, the more the drag force is. That's why there is far more drag in the water than in the, in the, in the ocean, actually, by the when, I mean, in the air. The object falls faster in the air than in the ocean. Or, for example, on the surface of, of uh, Venus, which has a much thicker atmosphere, has more drag because of the fact of the density of the atmosphere in Venus is much higher than the density of the air in the Earth. As opposed to Mars, which has a lot less density, which makes the drag force in this case a lot less, which means that the terminal velocity is much higher on Venus and Mars than on Earth because you need a lot of, so the object starts to accelerate, accelerate, although the gravity on, on, uh, on Venus, I mean, on Mars is less, but it's still accelerating, accelerating, and it takes a long time before you reach the, uh, the terminal velocity because of the fact that there is less drag. So again, this is the, some of the properties that you're, uh, you should have covered in there, and there are several examples for it. So the terminal velocity, terminal speed in given in direction, so that's a downward. That has to do with the velocity. So these are the, some of the key concepts. And again, this is just a summary of this, this stuff in here. So I'm assuming that you guys, at the end of the day, can solve this terminology. But, and at the end of the day, look at this review in here, which includes a video in there. And uh, also, but you must have done all of this. The, uh, what is, not week one, sorry. Yeah, week two. What is week two? Here is week two. Sorry. Yeah, you should have done all of these things in here, including the uh, the PowerPoints in here. But the PowerPoints are not supposed to be a replacement in lieu of the reading. You still are required to do the reading, and you have to have the book for that. So this is up to now. We're discussing week two. Now we're discussing this week and the item of discussion. I already talked about it. So uh, you guys can actually, since you're live at the end of the session, you can just copy and paste there and you're done with it. Now, I graded that assignment from week one. And if you have difficulty with it or you, there is an issue with your grade or something, if you did not receive the full mark, you should have received a comment next to it. Go through that comment and understand what I'm saying in there. If you still don't understand it, please let's meet on a one-to-one -one basis because I want you to perfect your, your, your replies so that you will have full participation grades for this one and also for the homework and all of the other things that is coming down the road, okay? But we have to do it on a one-to-one -one basis when we meet basically online and discuss this one. By the way, tomorrow morning, I'll be on campus, probably until like 1 or 2 p.m. So if you guys want to meet, I'll be more than happy to meet with you on campus, provided you will be wearing your face mask and I will be wearing mine and uh, 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 my office is actually on the 2700 building, and it's an easy office to remember. It's number 777, so it's three sevens. It's like the Boeing, Boeing 777. Okay, <laughs> so that's an easy remember to remember, and it's actually in the office, in the faculty offices, when you go upstairs and you enter the office, basically off, you go to the, where the, office, where the faculty offices are. You have to go around the corner. When you come around the corner, my office will face you. They're right there in there, 777. So I'm in there. So I'll be there. If you are coming, though, you still have to shoot me an email. Do not just come in in there and uh, because I might have all the times uh, scheduled. Okay, so I'll be there. But before coming, you have to send me an email tonight. Okay, because I probably would be busy with other things with the faculty and other things that I have to take care of tomorrow. 
and uh, but I will know there is no class in person, Nadia. Tomorrow is an office. Okay, I will be in my office. Okay, not in person. This is an online class. Okay, we cannot change it to an online face classes because then we will have a problem with the administration. They don't like that. Okay. But I will be there. If you choose to uh, come in and talk, especially about the grid or something else, or assignments, okay? Then uh, that's fine, okay? Make sense? Okay, so. Uh, Up to this point, point, we covered the items in there and what needs to be done and so on and so forth. Uh, the discussion is this week. The notes, let me pull the notes in here and let me go through them. But before I do that, I want to talk about the homework. Okay. This is not a type of uh, time and assignment. Okay. This is due September 10th. That's a Friday. Not this Friday, next Friday, okay? At 11 p.m. So please take care of it and make sure you understand it. Go through your notes, go through your book, ask Google, ask your classmates. The key thing in here is you do it and you do it to perfection. This is not supposed to be an exam. This is for you to help you know the topic. Does everybody understand the difference between a quiz, for example, which you're going to have a type of, an exam, which you're going to have type of, and this type of assignment, which is a homework assignment? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. Well, a Very homework good. is supposed to help you practice. A quiz is maybe to see how far have you understand of different topics like small part and the exam is everything together right very good thank you very much you, you put it beautifully that's exactly the point in here this is not a type a time and assignment this is not to test your knowledge this is just to help you progress through your knowledge in other words take your time consult as much references as you want work in teams if you want to you're encouraged to do so ask your peers, but you have to do it so that you know these things. Do not have it somebody else do it for you because at the end, it's, going, it's not gonna benefit from you, for you, okay? So that is the key difference in here. So let me go through these notes quickly in here. This is this week's notes. And after that, we're gonna have a practice examples and we should be in good shape. So let me stop sharing the screen. And let me close this one. Oh man, I don't have it open, so I'll have to find it now. Okay, I can download it too. I'm hoping that you guys Okay, I have it in here. So let me open, enable the edit, editing in here. And let me share, share. Where is the share button? Come on, the screen is taking time to load, okay? Share. Okay, you guys see the PowerPoints in here where it says momentum and energy? Yes. Okay, there was an important question last time, or actually a big thing that I made a big fuss over, 
And hopefully you guys remember it and I told you to hold me accountable for it. And that is why in the world we have to pass chapters. This, this thing's past the three laws of Newton since if we understand them, we understand everything. So why, where is the momentum and the energy are coming from? You guys remember this point in here from last week? Yes, maybe. But I did not make that point last week. Let me let me let me refresh your minds about my uh, the argument that I made last week. If I know the first law of Newton the second law of Newton and the third law of Newton, the promise is if I understand them and if I know how to apply them, then in this case, that's all I need to know in, in, in physics, in physical science in general, because those are the basis with which I understand everything. Assuming that I have mastered these three laws, so why in the world are we introducing the concept of momentum and the concept of energy. By the way, the concept of power is related to energy. The work is related to energy. The work energy theorem, and there is actually another one in here that is relating the momentum conservation with the impulse, which is another one in here. Uh, they are related in there. So all of these concepts, they're related to actually two key concepts only. Two key concepts that have been introduced so far are the momentum, and the kinetic energy. Once these two are understood, then we will then we're in good shape. So <clears throat> here is the thing: we're introducing the kinetic energy, and the symbol for the kinetic energy is Ke, kinetic energy. And then we're introducing also the concept of momentum, and the symbol for momentum is P. So if you see the letter P, what they mean by it is momentum. Okay. So this is momentum and this is the kinetic energy. So here is the deal so that we understand the question. These concepts were not pulled out, pulled out of thin air. They were not just invented for the purpose of invention. Okay? There was some rationale behind it. Historically, it has to do with something else because <clears throat> I can exert a force on an object in different ways. I can exert 10 Newton, for example, and take my time in applying the 10 Newton. Or I can take the same 10 Newton, but take it faster. So the time in here with which the force is applied to has some connection. It seems like there is a different impact of the force on how long it's, how, how long in time that is, it has been applied. In a similar fashion, I can take also the 10 Newton and apply it over one meter or apply it over two meters. It seems like the, the more distance I apply the force, the more effect I will have, the different effect I will have. So the force as it's related to time seems to have an idea. The force as related to distance seems to have a different idea. The force related to distance, as a matter of force times distance is what is known as work. The symbol for work is W by the way. The force times time, it is what is known as an impulse. And the impulse has a symbol J in this case, okay? Not I, J, okay? So those are the two key concepts in here. Here is the deal. It granted that the force changed motion. This is the second law. Remember the second law says A equals to F over M. So the force changes motion. Force causes acceleration. That's what acceleration means, change in motion. Granted the force changes motion. Here is a question. Curiosity, actually. We want to know how does it do it? How does the force do it? So here is the picture. We have an object sitting in here and the object changes its position somewhere else later on. So it was in position one, 
and later on it went to position two. It went through a path, it doesn't matter what the path is, okay? But it went definitely from position one to position two. By virtue of what? By the virtue of the force. So the force is the one that caused it to change location, okay? In doing that change, the object at any given point in time and space was subject to F equals to MA, to this relationship. In other words, the force caused the change in motion in such a way it changed location from point to point to point to point to point to point, to point until it reaches the final destination. The question is, how does the force does it on this scale? This is the answer to the question. The answer to the question is the force will change the kinetic energy. So there was a kinetic energy here, and there is another kinetic energy in here. So in the first position, there was kinetic energy number one, and at the end of the day, it has a new kinetic energy, kinetic energy number two. The difference between them, in other words, the kinetic energy at the final position minus the kinetic energy at the initial position is equal to the work. That is the work energy theorem. So we know the answer to the question. We know the secret of the force. See, we reach the point where knowing these three laws is all we need. True. And that's what we're basing our, our, our assumptions in here. We're basing them on these three laws. As a matter of fact, we use the second law to be more specific. And we ask the question is, how does the force do it? Well, in space, it does it in such a way that the change in the kinetic energy is equal to the work. This is the work energy theorem. Now, in time, there is a similar fashion. In time, if the object had an initial momentum, which we call it P1, and had a final momentum in the last position, and the force also took the object from state to point to point always where the acceleration is equal to F equals to uh, F over M at any given instant. Well, in this situation, the change in momentum, P2 at the end minus P1 in the beginning is equal to the impulse. So we answer the question in two different ways. This is behavior in time. And this is behavior in space. It's fascinating. I mean, I know it's more like a philosophy question and things like that, but it's important to understand the, the relevance of these things. We're saying last week's chapter, they are very important and they are by, by far. Today's question was a simple question. The motivation, if you wish, for trying to build on what we know already, okay? And that is, we want to know more detail. We want to know more on how does the force do it? That's really what the question is. What is the secret of the force? How does the work, how does the force does its trick in order to go from point to point to point, okay? In space and in time. In space, the force overall changes the kinetic energy. That is why the kinetic energy was introduced, okay? It's not some invention just to make things complicated. It is a needed concept. And also in time, the force changes uh, 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 the momentum. The object has a one momentum, now it will have a different momentum. So what is the momentum? The momentum, I probably need another uh, pair. Let me get a clean uh, piece of paper in here and write on it. Today's date is 8.30. Okay, so let me stop sharing the screen and share with you this OneNote page. And let me explain what these things are. So, Momentum is mass times velocity. If you work out 
a equals to f over m, you will arrive at this quantity. Because I could have potentially one mass and you could have another mass in here. This is sitting and this one is moving, okay? This has a mass and has a velocity, it has momentum. And if I push it toward this mass, it's going to have a collision. So at the end of the day, at the end of the collision, this will take some of that velocity, which is not the same velocity as I started with, as a different mass. This will probably will have a different velocity, not the same one I started with, but a different one in such a way that the sum of m times this velocity, which I'm going to call it the, ma the velocity of the big m, plus m times the velocity of the little m must be equal to this initial mass times the initial velocity. So this is the conservation of momentum conservation of momentum. And this is well, very well described in a collision. This is the case of a collision. This is the before the collision, and this is the after the collision. So the combination mass velocity is a key concept, okay? You need to know that momentum, so this is the momentum, by the way. Remember, this is not a replacement for your reading. This, you are still required to read these things and understand where they are coming from. So the momentum P is a vector. Its magnitude is mass times velocity, Ma magnitude times speed, I'm sorry. Magnitude is mass times speed. And its direction, direction is that of the, is that of the velocity. So it's really a vector, not a, not a scalar. It has direction, it's not just a number. The units for the momentum, P, is measured in the units for the mass, which is kilogram, and the units for the velocity, which is meter divided by second. So these are some of the key concepts in that. This is the case of a collision. The case of an, an, an uh, explosion is similar. So this is an implosion, if you wish. Collision is a case of an implosion. Pieces coming together. Explosion is a case of, uh, of, of collision too. Explosion, for example, you have one, I mean, one train made up of two cars, for example, car one and car two, and I drew them different in size, moving with a certain velocity, okay? 10 miles per hour, if you like, okay? Let's say, for example, this is a thousand kilograms and this is 1500 kilograms. And all of a sudden it experiences a separation. So the thousand kilogram, well, it was held by Velcro, for <laughs> which is kind of funny to hold the trains together. And now this one is separated from it due to internal forces, whatever caused it. So in this case, the thousand kilogram will move with a certain velocity and the other one, the 1500 kilogram will move with a different velocity, okay? Obviously this one is gonna be less than this one because it has more mass, okay? They may not be moving in the same direction. Usually in the case of the explosion, pieces fly in different directions in such a way. So if I have, for example, an object that was sitting in here, grenade, for example, it has internal chemistry in here, internal forces that cancel out. So if those internal forces cause it to split into two pieces, this one is pushed this way, the other one is pushed this way, the other way, the internal forces are, they cancel out due to the third law of Newton, action reaction principle. So in this case, depending on how, piece, how much the pieces they are, they will fly with different velocities. The, th the bigger they are, the more mass they are, the slower they move. 
The smaller the pieces are, the faster they move. But this is a case of an explosion. That too has conservation of momentum. So the, what this is saying then is that the change in momentum must be equal to the force times time, because that's what the impulse is. And this is the difference in momentum. Now for the kinetic energy, it's a different story. The kinetic energy is one half times mass times velocity squared. You will see the two here and you will see the two here. If you do the algebra, you will see the two is needed actually, both here and there, one half actually. For those who are cal calculus minded, that's actually has to do with the derivative. If you're not calculus minded, it has to do with the area of a triangle. If you are algebra minded, okay? It's the same thing. So basically what this is saying then is that, first of all, this one in terms of the units, one half has no units, it's just a number, okay? The mass has a kilogram and the velocity is in meter per second, but don't forget I squared these two things. Now, in honor of Mr. Joule, who did a lot of work on uh, energy and work and all of these concepts, this is named a joule. So this is a joule. So if you see the letter J, it's the same thing as this units. These are fundamental units. This is a derived unit, not a fundamental but it's something that derives from the fundamental units. This is, a, this is just in honor of Mr. Joule, okay? So again, this is the, uh, the, 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 the kinetic energy. The work is four times distance. If we do the algebra, it turns out the kinetic energy at the end minus the kinetic energy before must be equal to the work of the force, which is four times distance. This is the work energy theorem. If this is in Joule, this is in Joule, and so is this one in Joule. Force, remember, is in Newton, the distance is in meter. The Newton times meter is also a Joule. And if you remember, the Newton is a force times acceleration. The acceleration is a mass times acceleration, and the mass is kilogram, the acceleration meter per second per second times a meter. So meter times meter is meter squared over second squared is exactly this number terms of units, so the units match, okay? So this is the work energy theorem. The work energy theorem is a spatial behavior, whereas the impulse, this is the impulse momentum theorem. So that is the answer to the question. So the reason why we had to go beyond that, that uh, topic is because we wanted to understand the secret of the force. How does the force do it? Where it does it, depending on which behavior you're interested in. If you are interested in, uh, in spatial behavior, then the force will change the kinetic energy in such a way that the difference in the kinetic energy is equal to the work that the force does in going from position one to position two. And uh, the temporal behavior, well, the force then in this case changes momentum in such a way that the difference between the momentum at the end and the momentum in before is the impulse that the force will impart on the object during that time, okay? So that is basically the, uh, the concepts in here and how they are related to one another. There are all kinds of interesting problems in here, and I hope that you guys will have had a chance to go through them, to understand them. But this is in a nutshell what these topics are. Now, as a consequence of this concept of work, there is a concept of power. Power is work per unit time. I mean, look, I could carry the 25 pound bag of potatoes, for example, from the first floor to the second floor. From first floor to second floor, you're looking at about three meters, okay? Roughly about 10 feet, okay? 
three meters. And uh, 25 pounds is about 12, kilo 12 kilograms. That's the mass, okay? 12 kilograms times 9.8 meter per second per second, that's the weight, okay? So the weight, which is a force, by the way, I use a W, lowercase w, okay? Or let's not use that, let's use force, which is the mass, 12 kilograms, times the uh, acceleration, which is 9.8, which I'm going to roughly write it as 10 meter per second per second per second. So you're looking at a force of 120 Newton. That's how much force we're talking about, okay? So 120 Newton over three meters. So the work really I need to do is uh, 120 Newton times the distance I have to carry that, that 25 pounds of uh, potatoes, which is three meters. Okay, now three times 12 is 36, 360 joules. So that's how much work I need to, I can do in carrying uh, uh, 25 pounds uh, potatoes from the first floor from down to upstairs, okay? Well, I can take, well, because I'm old and tired, and exhausted and lazy, okay? It takes me 10 minutes to carry those things, carry it, drag it, struggle with it at the end of the day. I did your 360 joules. What else do you want me to do? In 10 minutes though, okay? <laughs> it's really ridiculous. That means that my power in this case is 360 joules over 10 minutes. So my power really is 36 joules per minute. That's how much I can deliver work. 36 joules per minute. Let's say, for example, one of you guys is strong, active, and can do the same thing in one minute. Can deliver the same job in one minute. So in this case, that person's power, so I'm looking at one of you guys, can do the 360 joules still, but in one minute. Obviously, this person has more power because they can do 360 joules per minute. Day. So if we have a bunch of bags, we have a truck to unload and take it to the second floor, it will take, it will, I will have less power, so it will take more time for me to do the same work than another one of you guys which, who can deliver the same work, but in a much faster way. So this is where the concept of power, except we don't use joules per minute, we use it per second. So the time, remember, in SI, in the MKSA system, is measured in second. So the proper unit for the power P, it looks like it's like the, so this is power, not momentum. So P, we saw it today for momentum and also for power. Let me give it a leg in here. So to make a distinction. So the power, I'm gonna give it a leg underneath. Just to make sure we're not confused which one I mean. But the power, is in joule per second. That's the unit for it. In honor of Mr. James Watt, they, they gave it the name of Watts. So the symbol for it is W, okay? And we saw the W used extensively. The W is a symbol for Watts, is the symbol for weight, and it's also a symbol for work. Please do not be too attached to the symbols. They are just symbols. They're presenting more realistic concepts, okay? That is actually uh, a point that I want you guys to remember also today that symbols are not intrinsic, intrinsic properties. In other words, do not get attached to them, okay? Do not so we use symbols. Sometimes we even run out of uh, symbols in the the this is the second item, by the way, okay? I don't want you guys to be confused about this one because down the road we will be using all kinds of symbols. So please do not say, oh, that was a symbol for something. So it must mean that. No. Okay. 
depending on the concept that is usually people understand it in the context. So depending on the context, you really have to understand that. And as I was saying, sometimes we use a Greek letters also, alpha, beta, gamma, so on and so, on, so forth, okay? So let me continue with these concepts because we still have an important concept that they're gonna be tested on, and that is the machines. So let me share the screen. So the last thing that we need to understand is machines. So a machine help you deliver work, okay? Or change the direction of a force. Okay, here is an example of a simple machine. This is a simple machine. Is the incline. So the incline is a simple machine because as I was take, talking about the, uh, the, the load of uh, 25 pound potatoes, I could take them straight up. I could take the potatoes and walk the wall. It's very hard to do, but that's what it amounts to. 12 kilograms times 10 meter per second times the distance of three meters, that's the same thing or pull them straight up or push them against the wall. It's hard, but it's doable. Or I can go on an incline. On an incline, the same, this is the weight, the weight which is 12 kilogram times 10, which is 120 Newton. So the 120 Newton is pointing here, but all I have to fight is this component of the, uh, of the force. The bigger the incline, the less this component is going to be, but the more distance I have to travel. So at the end of the day, the work is the same. The work is still 360 joules, no matter which way I cut it, whether I go through a steep incline or I take a very uh, 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 big uh, incline, it doesn't matter. The work is the same but one of them is easier to do than the other. That's the difference, okay? <laughs> this is why it's a simple machine. Another simple machine is the pulley. I have a rope in here attached to it. I have a load in here. I can come in here and pull on the load. I can go in here. I'm trying to drag it in here. For example, this is the floor I want to catch it in. So it can stand in here and actually start to drag the rope. It's one way, or I can stand in here and pull on the rope, okay? It's the same thing. I'm doing the same amount of work. In either case, I'm taking a load, which is sitting in here, and I'm going to end up putting it in a different place, okay? So in this case, what I did was I changed the direction of the force. So instead of pulling this way, I'm actually pulling on the opposite direction. So this is the difference. So this is a pulley. Pulley also is a simple machine. There are other simple machines that are used for different purposes. The gear, the wheel, uh, which are actually related to one another because they are they're related to the torque. Also the wedge which is a different uh, simple machine. And I'm trying to remember because so far I listed three plus two, that's five, I'm missing one. There are six of them, okay. Klein, the pulley, the wedge, uh, the screw is also another simple machine, okay. So those are the simple machines. Again, they are the screw, the wedge, the incline, the pulley, the uh, wheel, and the gear, okay? In any mechanical system, it's a combination of all of the six machines. That's why there is a difference between simple and compound machines. Compound machine uses more than one, okay? If you look at a car, it uses all of them. Does not probably use as much as an incline, but it uses all kinds of things, okay? 
it's a m machine that has wheels, that has gears, that has uh, pulleys, that has uh, all kinds of things in, in it. So that's the car, basically. It has all of them, okay? Those are at least most of them, okay? That is really how, and all machines, they have this these properties in here, okay? A key concept in here for the machine is its efficiency. Efficiency of a machine is defined by the effort over the load, okay? Then you would be given a lot of examples on the, in, the, in, this, in this chapter where you do them and hopefully we'll work out some problems. You will see that the machine is really, uh, there is not a 100% effective machine because usually there is friction involved and there are losses in energy. So that's why at the end of the day, the, the, this is less than 100% efficient. And then the other thing that you need to remember is that the compound machine Its efficiency is the product of the efficiencies of its components. Because this is a fractional number, and when I multiply a fraction by a fraction by a fraction, I end up with a smaller number. So a compound machine usually is less efficient than any of its components. So the components, they are usually more efficient individually than when they are put together. So this is some of the concepts that you'll be covered in, covering in this chapter. And it's all started with a simple question. How does the force do it? covered so many things in here, okay? How does the force do it? Let me go back in here. Well, the force to it does it in such a way that if an object goes from position one to position two, it's kinetic energy changes so that the work of that force is equal to the change in the kinetic energy, hence the work energy theorem. Also, if the object or at least in a different fashion, different way. If an object had momentum before and now its momentum has changed, then the uh, force will impart in momentum, an impulse that is equal to the difference in the momentum before and after. So this is uh, the, the uh, this is called the um, uh, impulse momentum theorem or impulse changes momentum, if you wanna call it that way. Conservation of momentum, conservation of momentum has to do with collisions. There are two types of collisions, elastic collisions and non-elastic collisions. Let me see if I have my demo sphere in here. Let me see. This is an example of an elastic collision. Can I change cameras in here quickly? Stop sharing. And let me change cameras. Trying to zoom. So I have a sphere in here. So this is an example because this surface actually there is a there is a uh, the surface is not smooth in here. So this collision is not really elastic because it dies quickly. But if I remove this and put it on the ground, and because this is attached to the camera, so it's very hard for me to remove it you will see that the collision approach is more of an elastic collision. So this is not an elastic collision. So we have elastic collisions and inelastic collision. An inelastic collision does not have conservation of uh, kinetic energy. And let me change cameras also. How could I do it from here now? So these are some of the concepts. So if kinetic energy is conserved, that is elastic collision. If kinetic energy is not conserved, it is an inelastic collision. That's the difference between them. And during a, a collision in the street, usually it's not an, an uh, elastic collision. There are all kinds of things where energy is wasted. So you have a car, which weighs about 2000 pounds, 
which is about a thousand kilograms, and another car, which is roughly about another thousand kilograms, and each and every one of them is moving. Let's say, for example, do not try this. Okay, it's very dangerous. 50 miles per hour, another one 50 miles per hour, and they get into collision and they stop. This one has kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is a positive number. It's a scalar. It's not a vector. It's one half times mass times velocity squared. So no matter how you do it, the velocity squared is going to be speed squared. So 50 miles per hour, when you square it, it's going to be 2,500 uh, miles per hour squared. Okay? Miles squared per mile per hour squared. Okay? So 50, time, 50 squared times one half times uh, 1,000. So you can imagine how many joules you have in here and how many joules you have in here. And then when they collide, all the kinetic energy is gone because the two cars are stopped. So where did the kinetic energy go? Well, it went into energy of sound because you'll definitely hear a lot of sound. It went to the energy of deformation because the cars will change shapes during the collision. So that it was deformed. You need a lot of energy to deform a car. So it's not easy to do it. It went to energy of, of, uh, of heat, actually. If you, if you have a thermometer attached to the cars during the, for the points of impact, you will see that their temperature increases, okay? And also with the, with the contact with the ground, that too also is involved. So this is basically how the energy is lost. Form of sound, form of heat, form of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, heat, sound, and also deformation. Okay, which changes the cars. So again, look, it is always true that using F equals to MA, we understand everything within three laws of Newton, we understand everything. However, uh, this, this transcription in here is not correct. It says F equals to MA, called it ethical. That's not true, okay? <laughs> okay, so. I need to fix that during the after I report this one. Anyway, so knowing this laws should be able to help us understand everything, including this collision. But now we have new tools to understand these things, which are momentum, impulse, kinetic energy, and work, and energy in general. So I was able to describe the collision for the for this case, for example, using energies kinetic energy before kinetic energy after momentum before momentum after both of these quantities need to be conserved at least the momentum is need to be conserved no matter what elastic or not non-elastic collision but then because this is an inelastic collision i was asked what happened to the kinetic energy where did it go because it's not conserved clearly the cars were moving now they are not so in this case i answered the question in terms of other energies involved that we didn't discover yet but we will the the the, the sound energy the heat, which is a different kind of energy, which involves thermodynamics, which we're going to be exploring soon. And then also a, uh, the sound of the deformation, which I mean, the energy of deformation, which I know it's also another energy because it takes that much energy to deform a car. So I was able to describe this one without introducing F equals to MA or a force or a mass or acceleration in that sense this combination because of this higher level concept that we introduced today and we were able to describe these things. Makes sense? Yes. Okay, very good. I'm glad to hear that. Listen, uh, with this is basically, I'm hoping that you guys go through these notes. Do not rely on them. They are 81 slides. Okay, there are a lot of examples in here. Read the chapter. Okay. Go through the examples. Don't forget that you have an assignment this week. You will have quizzes also, and we have a big exam coming. So hopefully I will see you next Wednesday. Not this Wednesday. This Wednesday I'm available also for you guys to meet. But don't forget that we have a big meeting afterwards at 1 p.m. So in other words, this office hours, I will not be available uh, on this Wednesday because I will be in a meeting and hopefully you too will be with us there but I'm available before and after, okay? So I'm gonna stop recording. Don't forget, we have two items this week, okay? And I posted them in the chat session. I know that you guys are going to be, some of you who are not gonna be live in here and they will be asking what happened to the chat questions. Well, in this case, the only thing in here is that you have to uh, go through both of them, okay? And I made a big emphasis on this too. The first one is actually reading chapters and doing the examples is critical.
because that's the only way to get uh, to ace your exams and your quizzes. And also the fact that we use a lot of symbols in physics and physical science in general, do not get attached to them. They, are, they don't have a meaning by themselves, those symbols. They just represent quantities. And those are the goal of the objective in here. Sounds good. So I'll see you guys two days after a week from today. Let's stop the recording.